This is the United States of America, home of the free and a land of endless possibilities. It's also home to this iconic red, white, and blue. And it's a nation where every state has a flag, including thousands of counties and cities across this great land. Welcome back. We're going to explore the United States from the east to the west. We're back here on the east coast and gonna check out a new batch of flags from cities up and down America's historic east. So how we plan to set it up is that each and every episode has a specific region of the US that we're going to look at. We split it up from east to central to west. Sure, this isn't proper geographical splicing, but it allows us to give each region the proper time and care it deserves. And speaking of care, this channel needs your care. So be sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. Hit the bell for notifications, and we also have a Patreon. As we continue this series, we will also examine what makes a good flag and a bad flag, according to the rules set up by NAVA, the North American Vexillological Association. As a matter of fact, let's do a quick refresher on the rules of what makes a good flag. 1. Keep it simple. It should be so simple that anyone can remember it and draw it from memory. Number 2. Use meaningful symbolism. Each flag's colors, patterns, or images should relate to what it symbolizes. 3. Use two or three basic colors to limit the colors on the flag. 4. No lettering or seals on the flag. Don't use any writing or organizational seal on the flag. If you have to use writing, your flag's symbolism has failed. And number 5. Be distinctive. You don't want to be too generic, and you don't want to just look like some other flag. It's okay to show relation to another flag, but do so distinctively. Number six, I have an unofficial rule, or more or less a warning. Remember, you want your flag to look good on a pole from afar. Flags aren't straight like they are here on a screen, so you have to take note of how the flag will look from many different types of folds, positions, and angles. So make sure your flag is recognizable in all forms as well as from a far distance. So with that in mind, welcome back to the East Coast. It's time to examine some flags of American cities. Nestled deep in the beautiful countryside of Maine, and just slightly northeast of Bangor, we have Old Town. And even though the town's name is Old Town, the city flag is actually pretty new, but it was a really hard battle to get here. It was the passion of a fourth grade teacher and his class that finally made this project happen. The classroom was even able to get professional vexillologists to help narrow down and choose good design patterns for a proper flag. What's the grade on this one? A plus. That first flag is just so good. Over time, those 80 flags were whittled down, but this city council would just not budge. As a matter of fact, they were criticizing the students and their designs. When I first saw the flag, I didn't see how it represented Old Town. I still don't see how it represents Old Town. But finally, May 3rd, 2021, the city council, I guess, begrudgingly accepted a new flag for the city. Thank you very much. Are we done? Are we official? We're official. Buy your flag. And I don't get it. You'd think the city council would be excited these students within their own city created a new city flag. Somehow the council couldn't figure out how this flag represented their city. Old Town, aka Canoe Town. I mean, the company Old Town Canoe. They're in Old Town, Maine, and they make canoes and kayaks, and they've been doing that since, what, the 1890s? And supposedly they're the largest manufacturer of canoes in the country. Old Town's actual motto is the Canoe City. Yeah. What's not to understand with this flag? Some of the biggest criticisms by people on the city council was that the flag was too simple, but therein lies the problem. They were missing the whole point of the project. The project was to make a simple and beautiful symbol for the community, not some kitchen sink design like M Milwaukee. The council wanted the city name plastered all over this flag, or a city seal or something. Anyways, let's find out what this flag means. 
So we have ourselves here a green flag with a white stripe in the middle and a red canoe in the center. While they left the flag fairly open to interpretation, the green could easily mean the greenery surrounding the city, the logging industry, the pines. Maine is famously known for its logging industry. And of course we have ourselves the red canoe, which obviously represents Old Town Canoes, the main manufacturer of canoes right in town, as well as recreation in the nearby rivers, and it can also harken back to the Native Americans who used to ply up and down the rivers. The white, to my understanding, doesn't have a meaning, but it could easily be rivers and waterways, or purity of the area. So even though the city council didn't seem to give these students much support, thankfully Nava and several other professional flag designers all came in supporting the students. There was many wonderful things said, and it's kind of heartwarming to see. It's actually kind of wonderful how this flag united people from all around the country, even though it couldn't necessarily unite the city council. Located along the Kennebec River and home to the famous Bath Ironworks, we have the City of Ships, aka Bath, Maine. And this city is famous, not only among tourists, but specifically for its ships. The Bath Ironworks is a major employer and one of the largest defense contractors for the US Navy. They've been making ships since 1884. Whether it was the 1891 USS Machias, or the 1953 USS Forrest Sherman, or the 2013 USS Zumwalt, they've made over 100 ships for the US Navy. So it's very fitting that Bath is known as the City of Ships. It's also very fitting that their flag has a ship on it. Designed by graphic designer Jeremy Hammond, his flag was chosen by the city's flag committee and approved by the city council in July of 2013. The city's flag reflects on the city's history and ties to the sea. We have a flag split horizontally in two, with a red upper portion, which stands for vitality and forward motion. Within this red portion, we also have a golden sailing ship, whose sails are down and being blown by the wind towards the future, ever exploratory. The lower portion of the flag is white, with blue wavy lines. The wavy lines, of course, representing the open ocean, as well as the Kennebec River. The flag was quite the success for the town, with the city featuring an entire webpage for the flag, and local companies selling swag for the flag. Bumper stickers, shirts, check and check. Even quality crafted flags you can buy and raise yourself. It's great to see a community unite behind a common symbol, which just so happens to be a good looking flag. Not only that, but in 2020, the city had its town logo changed to actually match the flag. So overall, this city in Maine has a pretty flag and a new town logo to match its picturesque location. Not only can you fly your flag high, but you can sail your sailboat sails high. Awesome. Guilford, New Hampshire has never had an official flag, that is until 2022. The city had long had this as their unofficial flag, and it really looks like an American flag with swapped colors. But here's where things start to get weird. This flag was actually used by a courthouse in North Carolina. Like Guilford, New Hampshire, this courthouse located in Guilford County, North Carolina, has long used this flag as their official banner, and somehow, Guilford, New Hampshire had been using it as well for years. Well, since 1781. This flag was made during the Revolutionary War at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. A lieutenant named Lamal Mason, who fought in the battle, eventually ended up in New Hampshire and named Guilford, New Hampshire after Guilford in North Carolina. And he used the same flag for the Guilford, New Hampshire town flag. None of this was discovered at the time until 17-year-old Darren Brown found it all out. While he liked the flag, he figured his hometown in New Hampshire should have their own flag, and proposed his own flag design to the town council. He eventually came up with this tri-color design consisting of blue, green, and gold, with a white chevron. The white is shaped to represent the mountains in the area, while the green field is the forests. The gold is for the local agriculture, and the blue the nearby lakes and streams. So the town council of appreciated Brown's new flag and allowed a vote to be put up between the new flag and the unofficial flag. Who would win? In March 2022, the town voted for the unofficial flag to win. Brown put up a good fight, 
but locals preferred the pseudo-American flag design, with many saying they preferred the traditional design. So what did the American-looking flag actually mean itself? The 13 stripes and 13 stars represent the original 13 American colonies. The red stood for valor, and the white stood for purity, and the blue for vigilance and justice. So there you go. The flag of Guilford, New Hampshire. It may have been a hard-fought battle, but the city finally got its first official flag. Schenectady's flag is a regal gold and purple with the city seal at the left-hand corner. The seal reads the city of Schenectady, as well as the year of incorporation, 1789. Inside a shield is a purple image of wheat, because back in the day, the Mohawk Valley was the hub for farming in upstate New York. Whether it was wheat or dairy, it was one of New York State's most productive areas. The colors of purple and gold are simply on the flag because at some time in history, gold and purple were adopted as the official colors for the city of Schenectady. This flag was officially officialized as the official flag back in 1984. According to the City Code of Schenectady, the city is required to have a city flag with the city's official colors of gold and purple. So until these rules are changed, this will be the flag of Schenectady. Even though it breaks some rules for having a seal and lettering on the flag, I do find its purple and gold color scheme unique. You don't see that very often, and you probably won't see this flag flying outside of City Hall either. New Rochelle is an example of a city that has a very vibrant flag, and it may break some rules, but people are either going to love it or dislike it anyways. Sadly, information on this flag was zilch. The key word here is was. Thanks to some awesome people at the New Rochelle City Library, a local historian, and some time, we were able to piece together the history of New Rochelle's flag. So get ready for the grand reveal. It was in the early 1950s, 1952 to be exact, that at the request of a city clerk named Charles Combs and Councilman Albert F. Campbell, the Municipal Art Commission submitted a sketch for the municipal flag to the city council. Reportedly, the city council liked it and approved the city flag in May of 1952. The flag is made up of the colors of blue, white, and purple. The word New Rochelle is in a golden yellow. The Art Commission also designed this city shield which they placed on the flag. The shield itself is split in purple and blue with golden logos and numbers. The dates represent the years the city was founded as well as the year of incorporation. The Fleur de Lis represents the French refugees who first landed here fleeing religious persecution in France. They were known as the Huguenots, or French Protestants. They established New Rochelle in 1688 as a reference to the French city that many of them came from, La Rochelle in France. The star represents the United States and how in 1899, the city officially became incorporated as a city. As for the exact colors and why they are chosen, it's unknown, but it should be worth noting that purple, blue, and white were traditionally French colors. Overall, despite the flag having some flag sins, I think the flag of New Rochelle is bright, cheerful, and quite unique. It looks much newer than a flag coming from 1952. We next head to the small town of Pennington, New Jersey, located near Trenton and in the scenic Hopewell Valley. Technically speaking, Pennington is a borough in New Jersey Municipal Code, but I will continue to call it a town just for ease. It also has a flag with a history that has never been told or shown online before. So instead of giving you no information about this flag, it was time to research the old fashioned way. What even are these results? I first want to thank two awesome people at the Hopewell Valley Historical Society, as well as a former member of the town's 125th Anniversary Celebration Board slash historian, who helped me go deep and find information on this flag. I'm certain what we gathered here is one-of-a-kind info never seen before. Let's dive in. So this flag of Pennington, we found out is actually not really a municipal flag, but more or less a flag commissioned by the town to celebrate a specific event. That's actually a huge revelation because the town itself seems to use this more or less as a banner or even as a borough flag. It can even be seen on websites regarding the town's history. So what we gathered is this blue flag was commissioned by the city for its centennial anniversary in 1990, 100 years. Sadly, I'm not certain who made the flag or its full meaning, but the stars at first, well, I thought maybe it would be one star per year the town has existed. 
That is until I counted that the flag only has 29 stars. There's also some evidence that the stars could represent fallen soldiers who had come from Pennington, but I'm not too sure. It was also discovered that the city commissioned a new celebratory flag be made in 2015, this time for the town's 125th year anniversary, and this is what it looks like. More of a banner in a sense, and breaking many flag rules with writing on the flag, but it evolves the stars from the original 1990 flag, that many actually still think is the flag of Pennington. Technically, this is the new town flag, but I don't see many letting go of the old flag. That building on this 2015 flag is actually the former Pennington train station built in 1876 and it closed operation in 1967. That building is actually now a private residence. The flag also carried over the classic blue along the side of the flag as well as the stars. So there we go. Pennington's flag mystery is mostly solved. And we actually learned that they have a new flag that doesn't adhere to the rules of a good flag, as well as their old flag from 1990. It's just so cool to uncover history that many have otherwise considered forgotten. Steel City, AKA Pittsburgh, has a very distinctive flag of black and gold, something every professional Pittsburgh team also employs black and gold uniforms. In the golden portion of the flag, we have the city's heraldic symbol, or coat of arms. We first see a black shield outlined in gold. In the center is a blue and white checkerboard pattern. There are also three bezants, each bearing the image of an eagle with its wings raised. Above the shield is an imposing castle with three towers. It's symbolic to Pittsburgh being a city, as well as the French-built fort of Fort Duquesne which the English later burnt down and built a fort of their own named Fort Pitt. Fort Pitt was named after William Pitt, the Earl of Chatham. That blue and white livery in the center of the shield was actually the Pitt family colors. They wore those colors when going to Parliament. Those colors also represent finance and commerce. Surprisingly, Pittsburgh colors have officially been gold and black since 1758, but the actual creation of this flag is harder to pinpoint than you think. Different parts of this flag were created at various times. The colors, the coat of arms, and the various symbols when it officially looked all like this isn't really certain. But I guess it's safe to say that much of this flag was created in the first quarter of the 1800s. Certainly a harsh and distinctive flag with a ton of history. Chapel Hill may be known for the University of North Carolina, as well as its thriving sports and food scene, but now it's also known for its flag. Okay, well, maybe not yet, but it's going to be known for its flag since we're talking about it, and you'll at least know. We have ourselves here a distinctive flag that all centers around a chevron design. A white chevron with a town silhouette separating the blue upper portion to the lower green portion of the flag. The original intent for the flag's symbolism was that the city was perched on a green hill with a bright blue sky above it. But over the years, that symbolism has evolved to be a little more politically correct or something like that, if you will. The blue upper portion somehow now represents the city itself and the University of North Carolina, while the green stands for the environment and how the city aims to be a steward of it. We also see the dark blue silhouette of the town within the white chevron. This features many landmarks in the city, including Old Well, the Moorhead Planetarium, and several historic churches. Back in 1989, oh, a great year, the city was looking for a flag to represent their charming community, specifically town council member Nancy Preston. She got the mayor, Jonathan Howes, to side with her in getting a new flag for the city. They established the Town Flag Design Committee to work and come up with a flag. Eventually, the flag designer, Spring Davis, made nine different flag designs, and the city voted and whittled it down to the top choice. The top choice was then approved by the town council. Today, this city flag can be seen at City Hall and on the uniforms of city police officers. Overall, a nice looking flag. Welcome to Fountain Inn, South Carolina. <laughs> no, no, this isn't the logo of a hotel, though we do have a room with two beds and a pool view if you'd like. We have ourselves here a fairly simplistic blue and white flag with a stylized fountain logo on one side and the words Fountain Inn on the other. Inn is in italics to show that it's fancy. Mm, so fancy. Yes, yeah, so fancy. 
As for when this flag and logo was designed, there really isn't much information on it. But one thing's for certain, the city is very proud of it, as this same fountain design can be seen at the Rotary Park in downtown. The park didn't exist before 2012, but did exist in 2015, yet the earliest known existence of this flag was in 2010, so they literally had the park made with the flag's fountain logo on it. You know what, Fountain Inn? You do you. Fly your flag high. I just hope it comes with a continental breakfast. Atlanta's flag is what is known as a seal on a bed sheet. A city seal over a blue background. But let's go a bit more in depth. Of course, right away we notice the mythological phoenix bird rising up from the flames. Wings spread out with eight rays ringing around its head. This represents the city rising from the ashes after the Civil War. We also see the Latin words for resurgence above the bird. And there are also two dates surrounding the city name. 1847 is the year the city's first charter was granted. The second date, 1865, is the year the city began to rebuild after utter destruction during the Civil War. So there you have it, Atlanta's flag. A seal on a bed sheet, but at least it has some history attached. I should also mention there are some rumblings online of people wanting to have the city change its flag, but so far the city is having none of it. Orlando is known for having fun in the sun, daily downpours, and massive theme parks. And now, they're also going to be known for a very nice looking flag. It's a major improvement over the original city flag from 1980. So it all started when the city asked the public how they would like a new city flag to look. They received over 1,100 submissions and over 156,000 hits on their website for creating a new flag. Through those submissions and public input, it was narrowed down to just a handful of flags. The city council chose this design to be the official flag in April of 2017. This design was by local resident Tim Eggert, but it wasn't quite done because then the city had the Flag Design Review Committee further enhance the flag with Eggert. By the time it was all said and done, the flag now looked like this. And on June 16th, 2017, it was officially approved to be the new flag for the city of Orlando. There's a lot of great symbolism in this white and blue flag. To start, the golden O represents the O in Orlando, as well as unity, because circles are infinite. It is also gold representing hope, happiness, and sunshine. Inside that golden O is a fountain, an iconic fountain for the city as a matter of fact. Located at the Lake Eola Park in downtown is the Linton E. Allen Memorial Fountain, which has long been a landmark and pride for the city. The fountain was built in 1957 by Linton E. Allen, who was actually a banker, but really wanted a beautiful fountain for the city. He actually named it the Orlando Centennial Fountain, but it was renamed in his honor in 1965. This city landmark gets front and center billing on this flag. At the base of the fountain, we actually see it split into six equal parts, which symbolizes the city's six main districts. You will also notice that the golden O reflects in the water, which symbolizes the reflection of the city's past. This blue water is also sharing a plane with the white upper portion of the flag, and together the colors represent peace, perseverance, and patriotism. By far one of the prettier flags, and it has a lot of symbolism as well. Orlando, you have yourself a good flag. Your neighbor Tampa could certainly learn a thing or two about flags. And there you go, that was this batch of flags from the East Coast. And don't forget that in future episodes, we're gonna be moving west across the United States until we touch the waters of the Pacific on the West Coast. And in the process, we'll be exploring city flags far and wide. And if you've made it to this point, please like, subscribe, and hit the bell. And don't forget to comment below. You can share something that you've learned or maybe a flag that you really like and would love to see talked about in the future. To see more content and have this channel grow, it's vital vital that you help us out in this way. We also have a Patreon linked below if you want to help us out monetarily. And don't forget, this is a series with several other City Flag videos you can check out on our channel right now. As well, we got a ton of other great stuff you can check out too. Anyways, until next time, thanks for watching and remember to fly your flag high.